Welcome to the next installment of the Creative Columbia Lecture Series. Uh, my name is Professor Thomas Doublefield. Uh, my, my colleague, Pamela Karimi, and I are so glad you're here with us uh, tonight. As you all know, this series is dedicated to looking at the, the challenges and opportunities of urban centers in the face of the process of deindustrialization. We're going to have a very interesting contribution to this conversation tonight. Uh, two scholars coming at the question from the, the discipline of, of landscape architecture, so we're really excited to hear what they have to say. Uh, before I hand the floor over to, to Pamela to give a formal introduction, I just want to uh, let you know about our next uh, lecture that will take place. It will take place in conjunction with our undergraduate art history conference, which will be at the new uh, campus library. And I, I really urge you to see the new structure if you haven't been there. It's really amazing. And to that end, we will have the architect um, who designed or published uh, all the renovations of the library talking about her project in conjunction with Timothy Rohan, uh, a professor at UMass Amherst, who will talk about Paul Rudolph's original designs of his projects in, in the New England area. So the conference will be on May 2nd from 1 to 6, and our keynotes, uh, the speakers I just mentioned, will begin at 4.30, and this will be in room 314 in the library on campus. So I hope to see you there. Okay, so without further ado, we're going to introduce our speaker. Thank you, everyone, for joining us tonight. So tonight, we have two great presenters. Uh, uh, this is a very interesting talk. Our first presenter, uh, Dr. Mary Stenmore, is going to talk about the subject of abandoning the temporary, reinventing urban landscapes from a more historical and theoretical point of view, whereas Professor Jill Bussamini, who's joining us today from Harvard, will talk about this um, same subject matter uh, from the point of view of a practitioner and an and architect. Um, allow me to, to read this um, um, abstract, which will uh, hopefully provide an introduction for this talk, uh, which captures the essence of uh, uh, both of the presentations today. Many attempts to reinvent abandoned urban landscapes rely on temporary initiatives. While these offer the benefits of flexibility and fast real realizations, they can too often fail because they cannot be maintained socially, ecologically, and economically. It is precisely these landscapes that are later co-opted with their uh, potential as productive landscapes um, uh, disregarded. Presenting projects and initiatives to develop um, abandoned land and cope with uh, this investment in a variety of European and American contexts from the 1970s to the present, the two speakers tonight discuss the, tempor the temporality of revitalization and argue for a benefit for the benefits of longer term landscape strategies that can restructure the urban condition. Professor Merzi Stanmore is Associate Professor of Architectural History and Theory at Pratt Institute School of Architecture. Her research examines how architecture, urbanism, and landscape design participate in the distribution of resources. She is the co-author of Street Value, Shopping, Planning, and Politics at Fulton Mall, a dissertation about the design of food markets in post-war France, as well as articles and book chapters about markets, biopolitics, and urbanism, and is the chair of the Aggregate Architectural History Collaborative. Professor Jill Bissamidi is an assistant professor of landscape architecture at Harvard University Graduate School of Design. Prior to joining the full-time faculty, she was a senior associate at Stoss Landscape Urbanism in Boston. She holds a Master of Landscape Architecture and Master of Architecture degree from uh, the University of Pennsylvania and a Bachelor of Arts in Urban Studies from Brown University. Her research focuses on productive landscape strategies for abandoned urban land. Without further ado, I'd like to invite Professor Sen to present. Thank you all so much for coming, um, and especially a big thank you to, to Pamela and Thomas for organizing this. It's a real pleasure to get to see New Bedford and see AHA and all the amazing things that are happening here. I was really actually moved by the um, parade and all the really inspired work I saw here. Um, 
I'm also really happy to say to be speaking um, with Jill. We studied together um, as undergraduates at Brown um, in Providence, and we used to spend a lot of time making movies about um, the Viking crew industrial remains there, and so we've been talking about what to do with the industrialization for many years now, and <laughs> it's fun to talk about it in a slightly different, more formal context, so it's first time talking together. Um, so, uh, Pamela's introduction is, is reflective of what we're doing, but I, I wanted to mention that we're talking about the idea of landscape in a pretty open way. So for, um, especially I think in my talk, landscape practices will involve what we call landscape urbanism, the practice of redesigning urban spaces as if they're landscapes, and thinking about um, the relationship between vegetation and built structures. Um, and well, I'm usually kind of more of an architectural historian, I also want to talk tonight a little bit more about um, my experiences working and talking with practitioners who would seem a little bit more germane to the whole series. Okay, so what are the pitfalls and potentials of temporary design initially? Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about New York and Paris, and then Jill will speak um, more about the context of shrinking cities um, in the US as well as in Germany. Um, and these are two really different contexts. So um, in New York and Paris, uh, land is not plentiful, nor is it cheap. And there's a different politics of urban transformation than in the context of so-called shrinking cities, where land is more abundant. Um, and there are other challenges associated with that. And we thought it would be kind of interesting to um, try to contrast those two situations so to uncover more of the logic of the temporary when we're talking about um, urban transformation and landscape transformation as well. Um, so please feel free to interrupt if you have questions. Nice to get um, So why the temporary? Recently, the idea of making um, temporary urban architectural and landscape interventions has come into a kind of vogue in the world of urban design, uh, landscape design, architectural design, and planning. Sometimes this is called tactical urbanism, sometimes it's called DIY urbanism, and sometimes even guerrilla urbanism. So examples of these kinds of practices are community gardens on squatted sites, um, community centers that might um, appear suddenly in a parking lot and then disappear uh, shortly thereafter, um, a beautiful parade like the one that I saw this evening, um, a skate park on a loading dock of an abandoned factory. All of these temporary and community-driven measures um, would kind of count under the new definition of tactical urbanism, temporary urbanism. Such projects often involve the reappropriation of infrastructure or abandoned land, and because of this, they're often temporary because people don't have access to really do something permanent with land. So part of what we want to explore tonight is why that might be good and why it isn't. Um, what's interesting about this kind of interest in temporary urbanism is that we only kind of have this idea that urbanism and urban intervention should be um, temporary kind of in contrast to a more general practice of urbanism that we know as master planning. So these are images of um, Le Corbusier projects for the Radiant City that he developed in the 1930s, which kind of gave us the idea that a landscape should actually be organized on paper in plan by one planning body, one authority, right? And this was kind of the birth of the idea of, um, of a kind of planned landscape. Um, <coughs> I could have, I guess, also included um, images of Robert Moses' transformations to New York, where he cut huge highways um, through existing neighborhoods, um, the Crosstown Expressway in Chicago, or even in Boston, um, the expressways that cut through the center of the cities. All of these were kind of big um, municipal and regional projects of the 1960s, um, which helped to kind of galvanize people against the idea of master planning because it was seemingly um, denigrating other neighborhoods. Um, I could also mention urban renewal and practices like that, where entire communities were destroyed um, with little urban feedback, uh, I'm sorry, with little political um, <laughs> feedback, which is kind of the very opposite of the kind of dem democratic and community-driven forms of tactical urbanism that we promote today. So it's really easy to see why this kind of practice has been gaining momentum for the last um, 40, 50 years, um, and why it seems so attractive to us. So small-scale planning really emerges in opposition to the practice of larger-scale operations of landscape and urban transformation. Um, and we see uh, a lot of kind of tactical urbanism responses uh, as a kind of critique of master planning, but we also see them uh, in the context of deindustrialization, which I know you guys have been talking about for a long time, um, in response to the oil crisis and the decline of manufacturing. 
Um, so artist-driven transformation, in a way, is a template for our idea of tactical urbanism. And a lot of this happened in New York. So I just included two images here of a um, restaurant, which was built in a cast iron manufacturing district. Um, this was a date, but it was in the early 70s, 1973, um, by the artist Gordon Mata Clark and Catherine Gooden. Um, so basically, they took a, a diner that had closed down and made it into an artist-driven restaurant in the basement of one of the numerous cast iron manufacturing buildings that were inhabited by artists in Soho in the 60s and 70s and 80s. Um, and on the right, I included a project by a group of artists called Group Material. Um, they basically would find uh, abandoned storefronts in the Lower East Side um, of New York City and were able to install a number of community-driven projects where they would actually show um, objects that were meaningful for the community around them. So the idea was to kind of critique um, the uptown world of galleries and to make the space that had been opened up um, by the decline of New York City uh, manufacturing world and kind of turn it over to people who are working there. So these kinds of initiatives are what um, contemporary architects, planners, artists are often thinking about when they try to reinvest their communities with a lot of fun energy. You know, if you guys have been through this, I don't times already, but <laughs> 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 so. so again, I think this was this produced um, tremendous benefits and a lot of um, life in neighborhoods where um, a lot of the life has actually been sucked out. Um, but as the sociologist Sharon Zukin has argued, um, this largely artist-driven phenomenon where the city copes with the loss of manufacturing um, and where arts replace um, uh, manufacturing, we end up having um, a kind of ground that's ripe for speculation. So as soon as these properties were artificially devalued, artists sat, sat in them for long enough until the value picked up. And if anyone has visited um, Soho in New York recently, you'll know that uh, you know, the, this uh, food restaurant is a um, camper shoe store which sells really high-end shoes. Um, and I actually don't know what's become of food, of food materials at this particular storefront, but most of them house um, luxury boutiques, drugstores, and banks right now. Um, so, <laughs> so basically, um, what the artists were doing is a form of what we often call land banking, right? They hold the value of a property for long enough um, until the, the property values rise and then people who actually own the buildings come in and uh, <coughs> So the cultural producers in creative cities are often in a bit of a conundrum, right? They're rewarded for taking advantage of forced disinvestment and lax regulation of real estate markets. Like, you know, artists weren't allowed to live in this kind of housing in the past, but they did anyway. Nobody bothered them. Um, and these conditions are kind of ideal for the re-territorialization of land and property. Um, so in a way, cultural producers get sucked into an economy of speculation whether they, they want to or not in places like New York, which have these cycles of investment and disinvestment, boom and bust. Um, I think both here in the streets and city context is actually quite different. Um, but I think it's something that avail us of the temper that we have to be aware of. Um, everywhere artists go, um, they often help to create the conditions that lead to their own displacement. And it's been very sad um, in New York in the last 20 and 30 years to see how much um, in Clinton Hill, where I teach, and uh, Pratt uh, and Brooklyn, it's just really transformed recently. Um, so this is one response to a kind of uh, shrinking city, the loss of manufacturing. Um, another one, which I think Jill will talk about a bit more too, um, was elaborated by the architect Owen Lungers um, in his plan called The City Within a City, Berlin as Green Archipelago in 1977. Um, he also realized that a city as large as Berlin was challenged by the loss of its uh, manufacturing base and also by the political pressures um, that were put on this kind of city, which was really a, a West Berlin, especially which was a kind of island in the sea of um, East Germany. Um, and he proposed a kind of response to this, which was really uh, a template for a lot of our projects about landscape and constricting cities, where he thought that landscape would kind of take over the city. Um, creating what he called an archipelago of green spaces and developed areas that would be located throughout. So in this drawing, you can kind of see the areas of the city that he thought would be preserved and rebuilt and extended, um, and the, the other parts of the city would kind of be the extended parks and forests and green spaces. So shrinkage, loss, and depopulation. Part of what made these processes of making the temporary into something attractive is that it seemed to combat the loss resulting from economic shifts of the 60s and 70s and to point for a new way forward. 
So given you know, all the potential in the temporary, why are Jill and I sort of provocatively, uh, <laughs> and we mean this as a provocation so we can have a conversation about it, um, saying that we should abandon the temporary now? Um, it's even more paradoxical given that the idea of tactical urbanism has itself emerged out of discourse of abandonment. So I doubly say we should abandon the temporary is somewhat strange and maybe even contradictory. Uh, but in the context of cities like New York, the, the argument for abandonment temporary often comes down to this. By making a moment of temporary beauty, you're often saving space for others who have more capital and resources to further consolidate those very resources and foreclosing the possibility of future generations using this site. The land they can as I mentioned before. You could also make the argument that um, you can demonstrate that disinvestment in infrastructure and durable community development is not necessary because one can just make do with the temporary, right? So if you say all of a sudden I'm going to make, a, you know, a community garden and um, land that once housed a, a officially funded community facility, um, there are people who have made the argument that says that it that it then enables people to further disinvest. Right? There's that kind of infrastructure that, that should be publicly and governmentally funded. Um, scholars such as David Harvey, in fact, have identified um, the creative artist as one who fixes broken communities as kind of central to the booming bus cycles of capitalism that created the pockets of this disinvestment. So I don't mean to sound completely cynical, but there is a kind of important uh, critique there to consider. Um, okay. So nonetheless, I do think it would be a huge mistake to deny that much good often comes from these moments of openness and availability. And so many of these actions are so beautiful, so I don't want to advocate for abandoning the temporary, but rather for reformulating the temporary um, in, a, in a critical fashion. Um, I guess I'd like to say we should abandon the uncritical temporary. <laughs> okay, so I want to talk now, i uh, shift to talking about a couple of more contemporary projects um, that have been worked on by architects, artists, landscape designers, um, which actually kind of take this idea of the problem of the temporary very seriously and try to find some ways through it. Um, so the first project I want to discuss is one called Lint Space by the urban design and landscape architecture firm Interborough Partners and the curator Adam Kleiman. The project seeks to make the mechanisms of land banking palpable to the public. Again, land banking is that practice of artists holding land um, while real estate developers wait until it's valuable again and then wipe out the artist projects and build their towers, which is what happens in New York all the time. <laughs> um, and also to help to interrogate its value, all the while offering a service to the community. Um, this project was built uh, on a 3,500 square meter parcel of land, so it's quite um, large, that belongs to Trinity Real Estate Holdings, which is part of Trinity Church, one of the largest and oldest landowners in lower Manhattan. Uh, Trinity sought to expand the site's value by building luxury offices and housing in the area. And um, in around 2007, they came up for, with this plan for redeveloping the area as a uh, neighborhood called Hudson Square. This is historic, meaning that they wanted to kind of rebrand it. Um, so it was located adjacent to Soho, so very closely tied to the uh, stories I was just telling you, um, and was one of the centers of the now defunct printing industry in Manhattan. In 2007, Trinity decided to demolish existing buildings in order to build them with more dense um, luxury uh, office and uh, housing spaces. But they knew it would take at least a year to get a permit before they could build. Um, so they decided to use the empty land to promote the image of their real estate development company and to make the area more desirable for other investors, thereby increasing the value of their land. They asked the Lower Manhattan Cultural Council to help. The mission of the Lower Manhattan Cultural Council is to create space for the arts and temporarily unused office space in Lower Manhattan. So what they do basically is they connect artists who want studio space to big office um, building owners who maybe have a two month gap between their leases and they give artists studio spaces in, in those buildings. And it's a pretty amazing program. It's allowed a lot number of artists who couldn't otherwise afford a studio space in New York to have a place to work. Um, so the Lower Manhattan Cultural Council proposed making a sculpture park out of the area. They thought this would be good use for it temporarily. So Trinity demolished their building and covered it with gravel and enclosed the site in a construction fence. While Adam Kleinman, the um, project's curator, uh, who worked with the Lower Manhattan Cultural Council, commissioned artists to create sculptures for the space. He hoped to make people wonder why the space had suddenly appeared, to question its value and what it might become. He also hired Interborough Partners, architects with a long history of working on temporary spaces in the context of shrinking cities, 
who tried to add more tangible community benefits to the project, enhancing the prior program of the sculpture garden, um, which was supposed to have provide culture and some greenscaping, um, to really provide services to the community of people that was there. So they did this by kind of performing an interesting analysis. They did a site analysis of um, traffic and circulation patterns. Um, they produced what we call chronotypes of pedestrian activity, showing what happens at different times of day. Um, and they analyzed the area's demographics, and they kind of discovered that there was a little bit of a different group actually using the space in the spot, not just office workers from the surrounding buildings and tourists, but also, really importantly, um, street vendors who often had to um, walk these long circuitous routes to get from one side of the site to the other with really heavy um, packs of things that they were going to sell. Um, tourist residents and also kind of unexpected, I'm sorry, local residents, and also um, kind of unexpected spontaneous users of the site. Um, uh, so they came up with a design for the site, again, underlying the temporary nature of the park, um, just as Kleinman had wanted to do. And their strategies for actually doing this involved um, building a couple of different things. Um, they left the construction fence around the site because they didn't want anyone to think that it was actually a kind of permanent um, space and to feel the aesthetic of the construction site. Um, they also made it incredibly clear that access to the site was regulated and controlled. So it wasn't just like a beautiful temporary public space that was emerging out of the blue. It was a, it was a space that was actually highly charged with what would have um, come to change in it. They installed um, planters after consulting with a team of horticulturalists um, and decided that a really nice thing to do, even though the park would just be temporary, was actually to build these really big tree pits that could be moved by a forklift. And so uh, they would plant trees and use the budget for this project from Trinity to plant trees. And then later, when the park had to be demolished, they moved them all over the neighborhood. Um, they also worked with the street vendors to figure out their ideal pathways across the site and use those to determine the design of the paths across the site. Um, so that was a central part of it. Um, they also um, wanted to help people who might not otherwise linger in this space, which is kind of surrounded by the entrance to the hall and tunnel and a lot of really busy traffic, um, to kind of find a way to use the park, even though it would, um, uh, they might not notice it at first. So they were really curious to try to think of the kind of constituency that the, sculptures park, uh, the sculpture park would generate. Would anyone become attached enough to the site to launch a campaign to save it? Could a temporary space be used to galvanize the public against the privatization of open space and to demand a call for a more public space in the city? Um, this didn't actually end up happening. The project closed and Trinity built its offer tower, office tower. Um, but I think it was a, a kind of important attempt to not just um, kind of uh, optimistically go about making a park, only knowing that it would be destroyed, but actually to try to design a park that would call for more parks like this to be built in the area. I think I'm going to skip through these projects. These are by a really interesting um, group of architects called Common Room, but they're maybe less related and I'm talking longer than I thought. <laughs> and I want to talk a little bit about um, another space in New York um, to talk about the interplay between the temporary and the permanent, which is um, Fulton Street Mall. Um, you can see where it's uh, located right here, right across um, the Manhattan and Brooklyn bridges, um, really at the site where the um, two bridges drop off uh, cars as they cross over from Manhattan. Um, the area became Br Brooklyn's central shopping district um, right after the two bridges were built, um, and people no longer used ferries to travel across the water. Um, and from the end of the 19th century to the present, it's been a site that's been um, subject to a long stream of improvement schemes that have been meant to tame the working class verve and energy of the borough's sh central shopping district through an emerging practice of urban design. So, um, in the 20s, uh, when the street was kind of a thriving shopping district right before the Depression, um, the, the plan was to take the crowd, this is a rendering, it wasn't actually built, but to try to um, separate the traffic and take the crowd of shoppers kind of off the street and make the space a lot calmer. Um, in 1945, there was an elevated railway <coughs> through the street, which was considered to be really dirty, so people wanted to take that down to try to sanitize the district. Um, in the 70s, um, when New York was in serious financial decline and the area was considered to be unsafe, um, designers felt that actually unifying the streetscape with plantings and urban design features and signage regulations would create um, a safer space. And in 2008, um, the area was completely redesigned as well. 
Um, but somehow, through all of these attempts um, to kind of tame Fulton Street, often many of which were actually aimed against um, Brooklyn's immigrant population um, and its African and Caribbean American population, um, this culture still ended up thriving in the 1980s on the street. Um, and so, uh, I don't know if you were a Biz Marquis, the rapper's fan, but um, <laughs> <laughs> um, Biz Marquis has a, a pretty famous song about uh, this area is called Albee Square Mall. Um, here he is with his crew. That they're actually like in a in an actual mall that was installed on the <coughs> shopping mall street. Um, but in 2004, the city said, you know, this is actually really valuable land. If we go back to the slide, you can see it's right in the center of the city. And what we should do is upzone it. So that means that all of a sudden the city decides that all the land that these buildings are sitting on is worth a lot of money because you can build buildings that are twice as high as the ones that were allowed in the past. So um, basically that threatened to displace um, a pretty lively and particular shopping culture that was there um, with a lot of merchants who actually made their own goods, um, customized shoes, t-shirts, um, record stores, and that kind of thing uh, with basically all the buildings that, the, that had housed these um, stores were threatened with demolition and all of a sudden their owners could command higher rents. So a lot of people got upset about this. Um, there were all kinds of new development proposals that were being floated um, for Fulton Street um, from 2008 or 2004 to 2008. But in 2008, um, before most of these, it takes years to finance this kind of big development. So very little actually happened except for Biz Marquis' Al beloved Alley Square Mall was developed. Um, and these are the renderings of the projects that were going to replace it. Um, luxury office towers. Um, and basically a kind of culture of commerce, uh, a, oh, sorry, also a lot of luxury condominiums and a culture of commerce that was more geared towards um, wealthy Manhattanites than um, the population of Brooklyn that had enjoyed its downtown shopping street in the past. Um, so 2008 happens, financial crisis, all of a sudden there was no money and boom, these temporary initiatives were desired again. Um, so some really interesting projects started to happen there. Um, this one uh, is called the Cal Market. Basically, um, a bunch of urban space consultants from London decided that the best way to maintain the area's value um, for a kind of new class of hipsters that was coming to Manhattan um, <laughs> was to build a series of shipping, bring in a series of shipping containers and make them into stores. And, uh, upscale food vendors, and actually Pratt um, bought uh, or rented one of these shipping containers to sell its students' work. Um, it was a really uh, successful uh, initiative in that it brought lots and lots of people um, to uh, what was basically an empty lot that they once called house the Aldi Square Mall, but also a kind of problematic one because, again, it was asking a kind of community of artists um, to use this abandoned landscape and, and maintain its value through landscape. Um, a group uh, called the Center for Urban Pedagogy that I, I uh, worked with um, got very concerned about the changes to Fulton Mall and we um, collaborated to create an exhibition trying to highlight uh, what was valuable about Fulton Mall at the time to argue uh, with the city against changing it. Um, and another project that I just will show briefly that I was involved with. Um, we did as kind of a response to the deployment of a temporary all over Brooklyn. It was actually a <coughs> temporary exhibit that we installed in the um, storefront right adjacent to Fulton Mall um, next to another area that was being redeveloped, which actually tried to trace the past, present, and future of the streets around downtown Brooklyn and should try to make clear to the community what was actually happening because it was very, very hard to kind of untangle um, what the strategies were for developing different parts of the um, city. It's a collaboration between architects, historians, and graphic designers. Um, and basically, uh, in the storefront space, which we left open to anyone from walking by or kind of wander in and talk to us, um, we installed these long streetscapes showing what was there. And then every place that there was a new development happening, we would um, include a photograph of it and details about it so that people would, would again know what was happening and be able to contact um, developers and local Congress people in order to respond. Um, so the exhibit was up for two months. It was <laughs> quite temporary. <laughs> um, I skipped through it, but it was a it was a nice project because it ended up having becoming a kind of meeting space for conversations, um, discussions, and exhibition about the stakes of change. Um, it was temporary but useful, and, and I think um, permanence would still be desirable because so much is continuing to 
Okay, I'm going to jump now to talking about a couple of projects outside of Paris, because I think these are a little bit more hopeful than the kind of depressing stories that I've told you about the pitfalls of artist-driven projects in, um, in New York, artists, architects, designer-driven projects. <coughs> um, this is a project called the Femme de Bonheur, uh, the, the Farm of Happiness, that was built um, in um, Nanterre, uh, which is a little suburb outside of um, Paris, uh, where there's a universe, a very large university that attracts people from all over the Parisian suburbs. And the, if any of you have been to Paris, um, the way that the city, you probably know, the way that the city is organized is kind of the opposite of a lot of American cities. The actual city itself is very wealthy, and the surrounding suburbs are actually um, quite poor and often involve um, pretty rough stories of people being displaced from elsewhere to, to live in the in the suburbs. Um, and so the idea behind the project was to try to find a very small pocket of land, one of the few pockets that hadn't been developed in this proximity to Paris, and to make something really beautiful there. Um, and so it started off as a temporary initiative, um, uh, but in part because it was so invisible. So if you go to their website, they say, if you want to get to the site, you've got to cross the campus of the university, keep the poet's alley and the circus behind you, um, and the trees in front of you, and then all of a sudden you'll see two pianos, this is one of them, and just kind of slip behind the pianos and you'll be there, right? So it's a very kind of amazing hidden landscape that's quite powerful when you discover it. Um, and the organizers started to have um, community garden plots, but they also held um, large dinners, plays, and had a community meeting space, and all largely um, under the radar of the public uh, for a number of years. Um, and it, it actually did do what Lent Space wanted to do, right? It became so popular um, and such a um, desired space, especially by the students in the university, that it's now, um, it's now a permanent space. So there's been a book written about it, and it's widely celebrated, and there's so much publicity and so much support of the space that it is unlikely to become untemporary. Um, so it's a really nice, positive example of the temporary becoming permanent. Um, another space um, that was developed by practitioners who thoroughly explored the logic of the temporary is by a group called Atelier d'Architecture Autogéré, which means the Studio of Self-Managed Architecture. Um, it's uh, a group of people largely led by um, two architects, um, Constantine Petku and Duena Petrescu, um, but often includes their students, neighborhood residents, and anybody who decides to take over their projects. They don't claim to have any authorship of them. Um, and they're very interested, unlike um, a lot of architects who design something and leave, they only do projects where they can make long-term investments in the communities in which they build. So in this project, um, there was a kind of passageway you can see it here between these two buildings, um, on 56 Rue saint blaise in a kind of working class district that was rapidly gentrifying. And this area had kind of uh, been used by gardeners a little bit, but um, not in a very uh, permanent way. And so slowly um, AAA began working with the group um, to kind of strengthen the program of gardens that was already there. So they ended up developing um, 30 vegetable garden plots, um, a bunch of small rooms where people could practice um, seed saving and biodiversity practices um, so they could grow kind of rare varieties of plants. Um, and 40 people who lived in the neighborhood had keys to this space. So it was really actually a, a kind of incredible widely used space. Um, and anyone who wanted to become part of it could be. And again, um, the space became such an entrenched part of the community that they were actually given permission by the city of Paris to make the garden permanent. And once that happened, they were able to build um, uh, actually an architectural intervention, this kind of um, gate and uh, biodiversity space in the second floor, as well as these solar panels which provide power um, on the site. So all of a sudden there was a way of kind of protecting the gardens that were inside, um, but also, uh, anchoring this in, in the rest of the community. So no longer was it just kind of like a space that was abandoned and maybe there were some people in it, it actually got a kind of official status. Um, um, and they did one other project which I, I think is also very, very compelling. Um, they, uh, but unfortunately didn't survive. <laughs> um, they found a giant hangar which had belonged to the um, French railway in the corner of a, of a working class gentrifying neighborhood that um, was kind of completely unused. And they got permission from the French railway to open a, a garden in its courtyard. And they did actually very, very little in this project. 
aside from designing these kinds of portable structures, which they call eco boxes, um, where you could build out of a, just a pallet and some wheels and some hinges, a kind of flexible structure in which you could make a kitchen, um, you could make a sleeping space, you could make a vending stall. And so basically all the ingredients of a kind of uh, contemporary village <laughs> were created um, in, this, in this abandoned railway site. And unfortunately, the, um, their, their work helped the um, railway to see the value of the space and it, it was destroyed. Um, but I think it's really important the way in which they try to involve the community in their projects and also don't leave. Um, because they basically want to make design responses um, be ways of kind of sucking people into actually being more engaged in, in their community. So all the architecture and landscape strategies that they design are there just to be a kind of support or infrastructure for other people to take hold of the project. Okay. So just to summarize, um, if we're going to say that we could be against the temporary, um, we might start say, Jill and I can debate this, <laughs> and you guys can too, please, um, against the concept of architecture as a static practice of design. So like if we're going to design um, temporary landscape improvements, they need to be ones in which uh, whole communities can galvanize through them. Um, that would be against land banking. So open land must serve its real users, not its hypothetical or future ones. Um, and against the temporary as a means of hiding one's intent. So processes of both gentrification and improvement should be made visible and knowable to people um, while they're being created. Thank you. So I, I guess um, we envision this as a, as a continuation of one talk, so I don't, I don't know that I have a, um, a true introduction, but I would say that I'm um, going to talk a little bit about the temporary in relationship to landscape and to probably land and vegetation. And I too, I guess, have a kind of conflicted uh, relationship with the temporary, so perhaps, you know, it's not for or against it, but also this idea of reformulating it and perhaps reformulating it so that you get the best of both worlds, uh, so that you can kind of think about what the temporary has to offer, but also why does that always have to be temporary? Like, why couldn't you do these things more long-term? So how do we kind of build that into the long-term practice? Um, but in some senses, you can also think of temporary um, in the way that uh, Karen Frank and Quentin Stevens think about loose spaces, and they say basically for a site to become loose, people themselves must recognize the possibilities inherent in it and make use of these possibilities for their own ends, basically facing the potential risks of doing so. And as a result, you kind of get breathing space in city life because you offer opportunities for exploration and discovery, for something unexpected, unregulated, spontaneous, and risky. So you end up getting, in some ways, more activity, um, especially in spaces. I, I will also kind of gear this in some ways to uh, places of abandonment to places um, where there are high vacancy rate, where there's a lot of underutilized land and where there's kind of a slow uh, economic time. So in that sense, you know, I think there's this idea that anything is, is good. Sometimes ecologists say anything green is good. So you might say like anything happening is good. Um, and so you get, you know, more activity, more diversity of use, a kind of increased stewardship of space. And also often the temporary can happen um, can be less expensive if resources are, are limited. And it has, in some ways, you could argue this, whether it has fewer barriers to implementation or not. But in some ways, you're only convincing someone to do something for a short period of time, which is often perhaps easier than saying, this is my vision for you know, forever. Um, and so you get things like this, which are really amazing, and kind of amazing different uses of an urban landscape. And so this is a beach in Paris um, that happens every year. They close off the banks of the Seine. They kind of open it up to this kind of temporary beach. Obviously, they couldn't do this all the time, but they can do it, you know, for a month out of the year, and people can kind of come and enjoy it. And so that's one way of kind of thinking about more diversity. You also get, um, as I was saying, a kind of activation of spaces that aren't activated, a kind of appropriation in this case 
of an abandoned building in Detroit, or you get, you know, um, kind of amazing structures that just start to populate lots. And I think, you know, it's really exciting in a way to think about all this opportunity that happens, and when land value is a certain way, you can just you can just do this. Um, and on the other side, you think there's, you know, 40 square miles of vacant land, and if you imagine that every lot would need like someone in the middle of the night to come in and put this on there, it starts you start to wonder about, you know. What is the longevity of the temporary? What is the kind of potential for transformation? And so we think, okay, what are the ideas against the temporary and in some ways specific to landscape? And so there's obviously no long-term security. Often you don't own the land or the land isn't really set aside for that purpose. So something, something could happen. Um, you know, when you're sort of thinking about vegetation and kind of establishing an ecosystem, You'd like to think that you know, with time you get more biodiversity and it's somewhat limited if you're only imagining something to be growing for a few years. This is probably my uh, own thing, but it increases the perception of landscape as expendable. So as a landscape architect, um, you get this, I think it's really much easier for people to tear out landscape, to kind of remove trees. It's much less expensive. It has a kind of different different uh, staying power. Um, I think it relies heavily on a kind of individual, individual initiative and individual uh, participation. And if it is maybe easier to implement, it also lacks kind of any infrastructure funding or support. And I think this is changing a little bit as people think about how do you make the informal formal or how do you kind of implement planning initiatives that are specific to temporary, but we're definitely not really there. Yet, as I was kind of thinking, saying before, the intervention might be disproportional to what is the kind of overall issue in this place. Um, and so you might be able to activate something small, but you aren't really addressing the entire picture. And so you're kind of missing an opportunity for significant change. Um, so the temporary, oh, so have any of you seen this movie, The Garden? <laughs> it's a documentary. Um, it's, it's a pretty good documentary, uh, and basically it's about a plot of land in South Central LA um, that kind of emerged as a, as a piece of property out of the riots, um, and then a group of farmers started uh, farming it in around 1996, 1994, 1996, um, and it was basically 14 acres, it looks like this, um, and it was kind of thought of to be you know, the largest urban farm at that, at that moment. And as you might imagine, since we're in the against the temporary uh, idea, the city owned this property of land. They were there for 12 years farming this, and at a certain point, they sold it out from under them um, at a kind of undervalue to a developer. And they sort of fought with like, whatever political means they could, hired a lawyer to kind of prevent this. But this is, this is what happened. This is 2007. Um, and then this is the most recent Google image. Google tends to lie about how the fact that they've sort of spliced all their images together, but if you believe them, it's, this is 2011, and it's, it's basically sat empty while the farmers have kind of been relocated. They still have a co-op. They are using kind of areas underneath um, infrastructure lines as a, as a kind of new, even less desirable piece of land in the area than, than this piece. So I wanted to look at a couple, a few case studies. Um, obviously, as we've seen with Meredith, that the temporary use happens in a number of environments. But I think unlike other types of development, it can capitalize on these issues. So these high vacancy rates, these underutilized lands, these slow economic times. And I would argue that spontaneous vegetation uh, roots itself in a similar context. And so I'm gonna look at a, a number of case studies of what I might term as temporarily vegetated spaces over time, um, some of them very positive, so they, they, you, they will become permanently vegetated spaces over time, to kind of explore the intersection between temporary and urban land conservation. So in this sense, the plants and the animals, in addition to the, to the humans, tend to be the pioneers. And the, there are still spaces that are either in the state of no longer or not yet, but through some um, advocacy measures, they can become spaces that are Although I would, what I would argue, especially in this country, um, the kind of definition of what they are is not fully adopted and kind of not fully a part of our land use vocabulary. Um, and I'm also gonna start with this quote, which is from Urban Catalyst, which is a, a group of architects and landscape architects 
out of Berlin, which look at uh, developing planning tools um, from the observation and understanding of informal practices in the city. So how you might look at what's happening and extract a series of observations that might become tools towards encouraging this implementation. But I think it's, you know, it's fitting for this context, saying that in the post-colonial age, so to speak, it is more about addressing what has already been built and how it accumulates over a period of time. In this process, the view is reversed. The built environment is no longer the goal, but the starting point, and a different perception of the existing city is associated with this change, and new perspectives on development open up from this perspective. So the first case is in Boston, which is not a shrinking city, um, but is a city that, uh, when this project started, was in a very different place. Uh, could be argued a shrinking city in 1976. And so this is a uh, project, I don't know, are any of you familiar with the urban models in Boston? They're pretty excellent. Um, I've become kind of obsessed with them lately as I worked on a project for Bussey Brook, which is a piece of the Arnold Arboretum. But essentially this program uh, came out of the Boston Redevelopment Authority, which is interesting in and of itself and a topic perhaps in a longer talk, but um, by a landscape architect who was not from the city and who was kind of struck as he was working as a landscape architect at the VRA by the kind of geology and topography that Boston had and, and he wasn't familiar with this. So he wanted to find a way to kind of measure, catalog, and ultimately conserve these unplanned open spaces in the city. Um, so he kind of developed a catalog of them. They're, they're referred to at this point in time as natural uh, open spaces, which is, an, I suppose, an interesting, I guess it depends on how you view the word natural, but they do occur without um, explicit human intervention, though they probably don't occur without lots of human intervention at the same time. But these are the kind of classifications, and they were very much sort of thought to be the kind of natural uh, additive to the emerald necklace. Um, so places like this, um, and kind of thinking of at that time, what are the development pressures? Um, and then Hancock Woods in West Roxbury, and they're basically saying a third of these sites are kind of threatened by development. So how can I go out? He thought he'd find a handful of them. He found 143 of them um, through kind of aerials, his own, his own uh, going out, uh, talking to planners, and so there were a lot more than they imagined. Um, and this is kind of the frontispiece of the, of the book by, by the then mayor, um, just arguing that these natural areas uh, have becoming, are becoming less and less as the city grows, and how could we actually think about this right now in 1976, when we're at a point where the city could, could sort of, development pressure is increasing, how could we actually conserve them, and so figure out a way to purchase them. Uh, this is the kind of map that they included. Nothing has, has gotten much more uh, sophisticated o over time. But um, you can kind of see that they're not, that they're in the places that you might imagine them to be. They're not in the kind of downtown area. They're along industrial waterways. They're in kind of neighborhoods uh, that have, have been subjected to this kind of development over time. And so in 1976, there were 143 of them, 2,000 acres. There's now 110 and 14, 15. I'll, I'll let you decide whether that's a positive story or not. Um, the, and this is, there's sort of 33 that have been lost since then, 55 unprotected, 55 protected. The particular individual involved decided he didn't want to make a life out of this, so he left and he started private practice, but at the, at the Boston, um, now it's the Boston Natural Areas Network basically formed to find money to start to purchase and, and conserve these places. And so this is just a quick map of what has kind of been lost, what has been degraded, and what is kind of protected and unprotected to this moment. And what, how that is in relationship. In this case, they're green, the urban wilds, and they're kind of measured against the other types of um, sort of city designated open spaces. So that's kind of how they fit in this network. Right now the BNAN also, so they expanded their mission to actually start to conserve um, community gardens and to kind of look at corridors and greenways, so ways that you might actually connect these so that they could become more of a system. But they remain somewhat threatened. This is Hellenic Hill. It's on the edge of Jamaica Pond. It's for sale at the moment looks like this. 
at the ground. And so it's it's an unprotected piece. If it were if it were developed, I think it would be kind of a great loss at this moment. They haven't had sort of huge losses perhaps since the airport expansion and, and other things that happened earlier on. And this is Buzzy Brook Meadow. Um, we're unfortunate to be working on a project uh, and in the winter, just to kind of see the cattails are still pretty exciting in the winter. This is just a quick overlay to say that just these naturally occurring areas in some ways they're conserved by a, a set of set of things that happen to them. They're sort of next to the railroad, have are kind of cut off by circulation, are low points that have become kind of manipulated or time or are easily flooded. There's a ton of dumping that starts to happen and there's kind of buildings that happen that are around them. So they're highly manipulated in a way, but as a kind of result of their undesirability are, are allowed to be kind of left vegetated and in some cases adopted in this case as part of the indenture of the arboretum. And the kind of, this is the, this is the Bussy Brook, the soda can buoy, and I'm sort of looking at it through the same way. So I'm gonna jump to Berlin, which has a much, um, I guess, richer culture of talking about urban wilds and kind of clearly articulated concepts of, of what these spaces could be. So clearly articulated concepts of industrial nature or the nature park. Um, and to look at a little, a little, little, little park, which is the kind of first spontaneously vegetated piece of Berlin that was turned, that was sort of conserved and turned into a park. Um, it's, uh, in Kreuzberg, and it's a basically a black locust grove that, um, as of 1987, was kind of conserved. And Germany has a much kind of different relationship to vegetation, such that you can't can't cut down certain trees, and, and certain things are much more protected. But they also have a kind of appreciation, I think, just culturally more widespread of what these spaces these spaces could be. Um, so that's the kind of first uh, emblem of these kind of parks. The next one, which is the nature park, the Volande is kind of the, the most talked about um, and, and sort of the most often referred to as an example of a nature park. And uh, like you might imagine, uh, these spaces are sort of organized around, uh, around infrastructure. This is a kind of typical, typical derelict railroad site, which um, was kind of scaled down after the Second World War and completely shut down in uh, 1952, and at that point, the particular political situation was that this piece of property is in West Berlin, it was owned by a company in East Berlin, and it kind of sat there. Uh, and as it sat there, um, kind of for 50 years, a sort of very diverse, species-rich natural oasis kind of developed in the heart of the city uh, with a kind of grassland component, <coughs> a woodland component, and kind of very rare herbaceous vegetation. And essentially, because it was uh, sort of studied systematically with, by what's known as the Berlin School of Urban Ecology, somewhat contributed to its ultimate transformation into a park uh, in May of 2000. And so at, at this point, there was a lot of development pressure on Berlin. There still is a lot of development pressure on Berlin. But due to the kind of neighborhood which had grown to love this space and to these ecologists, which had very kind of systematic measured examples of, of what the vegetation was, how the ecosystem was functioning. They were able to keep the park and then to make some um, decisions about how to integrate more active human use within it because this herbaceous vegetation obviously didn't want to be trampled. If you let the site go all the way, it would become woodland. And so they kind of made the decision to keep, but to keep the central area as a kind of conserved area as a conserved woodland, and then to arrest certain areas in their grassland state, and then to devote other places to kind of at the entry and around the locomotive hall to kind of more intense cultural programming. And so this is kind of looking at that natural, uh, or the sort of, un so the area that's let go, that's, that's being transformed into a woodland with a series of kind of boardwalks and art installations that were put into it. This is an area that you can see the railroad tracks still. They kind of left everything in place, which is a kind of typical, perhaps, way of, of addressing this. Um, this area is then maintained. It's maintained by sheep as they kind of move around. 
although they're having some trouble with the sheep because although they're really excellent at maintaining, they're not that discretionary, so they are eating the very um, treasured species. They don't, they don't see the difference somehow, so I think they're kind of figuring out how to, how to deal with that management. And then there's kind of sort of pieces of walls. They invite people to do sort of art projects onto them and, and kind of use them as a display. So we're going to switch for a second to Tempelhof, which is so that Sogoland is the switching yards for Tempelhof, but this is um, kind of looking at the temporary as a holding strategy um, rather than perhaps as a, as a way of converting the site from the beginning. So this is the Tempelhof airport. Um, essentially, they, they chose to expand the other airport and it was closed in 2008. Um, as an, as an airport and opened as a sort of public park in 2010, but there's kind of planning for a longer real park underway. And so they kind of advertise it, the website is very um, very good and they, they kind of explain every, every piece of the project, but they describe it's a 900 acre piece parcel in the middle of the city. It's like taking a trip to the countryside. Uh, that pioneers and interim users bring new life. So essentially, they've opened it to the public. They've declared certain places off limits because of because of species, um, but they're kind of trying to encourage people to do all sorts of fun things in the park as it's as it's awaiting its its longer term development, tremendous building. Um, but basically, it's also being planned as a kind of expansion for the city, and so this is the. Under this airport building, they're, they're planning on bringing uh, urban development up into it and kind of developing the park but leaving certain aspects of the site alone. These are kind of images from the competition winning design firm led by a Scottish landscape architect, her firm called Grossmax. And then this is the plan of the site as it exists. So the runways have become these kind of amazing places for biking and inline skating. You're not allowed in the spaces marked by the birds for the kind of skylark. You can go in certain seasons, but in certain seasons you can't. Um, and you kind of get a sense of, of the kind of use. It's, it's actively used. It's a pretty amazing space to be in in the middle of the city. Um, so some of the kind of pioneer installations that they've started to, to show. This is when you can go in the meadow. And so I guess the last case study I'll look at is perhaps less optimistic, um, but also kind of an interesting case in and of itself. It's in Dessau, which is in the Saxony-Anhalt region, um, which is probably an hour and a half from Berlin. It's a city of about 88,000 people, so I guess a little bit smaller than New Bedford, um, that's kind of experienced a pretty traumatic history and is experiencing um, population loss currently. Uh, especially sort of after the after the unification, um, but it was also a site of intense bombing in World War II, of a huge kind of Soviet chemical industry, and now people are can leave are leaving sort of as, as much as they can. There's a sense of that of that urban fabric, um, and we'll look at a project that was conceived as part of a larger effort. Um, it's part of an international building exhibition, which happens probably every two years, I'm not entirely sure. But it was kind of radical as the idea of an international building exhibition, because it was a building exhibition without any buildings in a region that is <coughs> losing population. So in a region of small towns losing population, and sort of as a way to kind of think about strategies to, to reinvest and to kind of rethink um, the future of these places. And, the, and, and so, up until the exhibition itself, they basically approached these, I think, 18 small towns and asked them to kind of reconceptualize themselves in, in some way. So to come up with an identity, and there was an office that sort of worked with them to, to develop these identities, and they're, they're all, some of them have to do with the kind of rich culture heritage, some of them have to do with education or kind of clean industries. Um, in the case of Bissau, it had to do with landscapes and um, to come back to the to the uh, Oswald, um, project, the Green Ar Archipelago that um, it's not the same Unger's project, 
uh, that Meredith that Meredith started with. It's kind of a direct, I would say, derivative of that project. Um, this is the plan for it, and basically, it's looking at um, at developing a kind of series of landscape zones that would be sort of engulfing the city. And so you would leave areas of built of built fabric, but they would be kind of engulfed by this by this landscape system. The landscape system that's kind of tied together with the with the red set and, and sort of conceived in a couple of stages. Um, and the first stage has to do with this idea of the claim. And so in order to create this landscape zone, they basically divided the entire city into these 20 by 20 meter um, pixels, they're calling, these kind of literal and figural claims uh, for the city. And the idea was that these pixels would either be, um, and it should be mentioned, so this now has a kind of rich garden realm history, Berlitz is there. And so they were kind of divided either between a kind of oak quincunx, which is a historical planting um, strategy, a kind of meadow that would be mowed once annually, or these actual claims where community groups would come in and sort of take that piece of land and do, and do something with it. Um, and so they, had, they got 19 claims. Um, these are the 19, they're diverse from a kind of apothecary garden, worlds are different, you could actually make medicine out of your garden, um, to a kind of BMX, to a sort of into a cultural garden, and people started to, to, um, to uh, adopt these spaces, and I think in some ways it's kind of this brilliant strategy of how do we engulf our city into these landscape bands, can we do it kind of incrementally, um, can we do it in a way that's very flexible, that creates this greater framework, and they have this idea of so the pixel, basically the city gains resolution as more and more people adopt into it. However, so this is the kind of vision, this is sort of what it more looks like uh, when you see it in, in, in relationship to the city fabric. And so you get these little dots of claims, which are the orange. And, and so this project opened in 2002, and um, in 2002, in 2010, sorry, and basically uh, by 2012, most of the claims have been kind of abandoned in some in some form, and so some of them are still going. And you know, they they the sort of BMX people were local students that they adopted it to, and so there was a person in the beginning kind of managing the claims, sort of figuring out a way to do it. That office closed when the building exhibition left, and so. There's a couple, the, the pharmacist is still very involved, there are a few that you could actually read, but for the most part, um, they start to get lost, as we'll see it a little bit later. And then they made a few infrastructural improvements. Um, this gives you a little bit more of a sense of how they're, how they're uh, consolidating the urban fabric. So these are two buildings um, opposite each other, uh, kind of Soviet housing, one that they've decided to keep on the right and one that they've decided not to keep on the right and they're basically just waiting until everyone moves out of this building on the left to then demolish it and kind of I mean you could you could have your own opinion as to how ethical of a system that is. But um, basically they've pinpointed this is this is the one we're keeping, this is the one we're not keeping and it's it's kind of a slower process of transformation than we might have here. But they painted it, they add balconies and they sort of and the other thing that they've started to do in terms of the infrastructure, apart from the claims, is to close down. So as they make those decisions, they can start to close down streets and pieces of infrastructure within it. And so this is one street that they've, that they've closed down that you sort of see in the middle. This is a view of that street uh, before it was closed. Um, so on the top, in full occupation, on the bottom, you sort of very close to the moment at which they closed it. And these are kind of views of what that kind of landscape and pathway starts to look at. So I think there are kind of optimistic moments within it um, and kind of quite beautiful places where if you could imagine the landscape taking root and, and, and sort of envisioning this transformation. And then there are places like this where, you know, yes, you never see the city from the aerial view, but you can also see, like, here's a claim, there's a claim, and you can kind of see how they're, in some ways, not a strong enough structure or system to actually 
route the transformation. And so I guess um, the kind of thing that I would like to think about is that in some ways I think the temporary can be most effective as a kind of overlay on, an, on another structure that is quite strong rather than actually being the driver of kind of transformation in urban form. So maybe to come back to the left space interborough project, it's like, okay, we put this in, will people galvanize around it? Will it be able to kind of transform? And I would argue that I think we rely on it a little bit too much as this is a kind of easy solution, but in some ways it won't actually enact enough of a kind of structural change to kind of <coughs> create a creative.